Similarities between Hinduism and Islam. In order to understand any religion, we should try and understand what the scriptures have to speak about Almighty God. In order to understand Hinduism in the right perspective, we should look at the authentic sources. And the most authentic among the Hindu scriptures is the Vedas. The major difference between the common Hindu and us Muslims is the common Hindu says that everything is God. We Muslims say everything belongs to God. Everything is God's. G-O-D with an apostrophe S. So the major difference between the common Hindu and us Muslims is the apostrophe S. If we can solve this difference of apostrophe S, the Hindus and the Muslims, we will be united. Due to the time limitation, I will discuss a few more similarities. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the glorious Quran in Surah Maida chapter number 5, verse number 90. Ya you all ladin amanu, O you who believe, in namal khamru wal maisiru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, wal ansaw wal aslam, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, ritsum bin amal shaytan, are an abomination from Satan's handiwork. Fajtani buhu la'allakum tuflihun. Abstain from such abomination that you may prosper. Alcohol is even prohibited in the Hindu scriptures. It is mentioned in Manusmiti, chapter number 9, verse number 235. That a priest killer, a liquor drinker, a thief, and a violator of the Guru's marriage bed, these people, they are committing major sins. Few verses later, Manusmiti, chapter number 9, verse number 238, that these miserable men, no one should eat with, no one should sacrifice for, no one should read to, no one should marry. They should be left wandering in the earth, excommunicated from all religions. Further, it's mentioned in Manusmiti, chapter number 11, verse number 55, that a priest killer, a liquor drinker, a thief, and a violator of the Guru's marriage bed, and those people associated with these people, they are committing major sins. Alcohol is prohibited in the Hindu scriptures in several places. Manusmiti, chapter number 9, verse number 225. Manusmiti, chapter number 7, verse number 47. Rigved, book number 8, hymn number 2, mantra number 12. Rigved, book number 8, hymn number 21, mantra number 14. And further Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya you all ladina amanu, O you who believe, inna mal khamru wal maisiru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling. Gambling is prohibited in Islam. Same thing in the Hindu scriptures. It is mentioned in Rigved, book number 10, hymn number 34, mantra number 3, that the gambler says, my wife holds me aloof, her mother hates me. The wrecked man finds none to comfort him. Further, a few verses later, Rigved, book number 10, hymn number 34, mantra number 13, play not with dice, cultivate thy land and enjoy the wealth. Further, it's mentioned in Manusmiti, chapter number 7, verse number 50, that a liquor the gambler and one who indulges in hunting, these are the worst four kinds of people. For the gambling is prohibited in the Hindu scripture in several places. Manusmiti chapter number 7, verse number 47. Manusmiti chapter number 9, verse number 221 to 228. And Manusmiti chapter number 9, verse number 258. Further Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wal ansab wal aslam, dedication of stones, divination of arrows. Fortune telling is prohibited in Islam. Same thing in the Hindu scriptures. It is mentioned in Manusmiti, chapter number 9, verse number 258 to 262. That anyone who earns his living, a fortune teller, a good teller, a soothsayer, the king should punish them according to the severity of their crime. And regarding bribing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 188. Wa la wa Use not your wealth as a bait for judges. Bribing is prohibited in Islam. Same thing in the Hindu scriptures. 
It's mentioned in Manus Mithi, chapter number 9, verse number 258 to 262. That whosoever deals with bribing, the king should punish them according to the severity of their crime. Regarding pork, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in no less than four different places, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 173, in Surah Baida, chapter number 5, verse number 3, in Surah Adab, chapter number 6, verse number 145, and in Surah Nahl, chapter number 16, verse number 115, Hurribat alaykum al bayta to wadda wa al khadzir, wa ba hilla li ghayri lahbi. Forbidden for your food are dead meat, blood, flesh of swine, and any food on which any other name besides Allah's name has been taken. These four types of food are prohibited for us Muslims. Same thing is mentioned in the Hindu scriptures. Pork is prohibited in the Hindu scriptures. It is mentioned in Manuspati, chapter number 5, verse number 19. That a Brahmin knowingly, if he eats cock, onion, or the meat of bacon, the meat of pig, he shall fall. For that mentioned Vishnu Sutra, chapter number 5, verse number 49, that anyone who sells a forbidden meat, his opposite hands and limbs should be chopped off. Punishment that is mentioned in the Hindu scriptures, it is not mentioned in the Quran. So Hinduism and Islam both are against having the meat of pork. This is a misconception as far as the modesty of women is concerned. Many people say, that why does Islam subjugate the woman by keeping her behind the wheel? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, it's the Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30. قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ وَيَحْفَذُ فُرُوجَهُمْ Say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. Whenever any man looks at any woman, if any blazing thought, if any unashamed thought comes to his mind, he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. Next verse, Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31. Say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty and display not her beauty except what is ordinary of and tell her to draw her veils over bosoms and display not her beauty except in front of their husbands, their fathers, their sons. And there's a big list of mehrams of close relatives who she cannot marry. There are basically six criteria for hijab that I mentioned in the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith. The first is the extent for the man and for the woman. For the man, it is from the navel to the knee. And for the woman, it is the complete body should be covered. The only parts that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. The remaining five criteria are the same for the man and for the woman. The second, the clothes they wear, it should be loose. It should not be tight fitting. It should not reveal the figure. Third, that it should not be towards lucid or towards spirit. Fourth, that it should not be so glamorous that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, that it should not be that of the opposite sex. And sixth, that it should not resemble that of the unbeliever. These are basically six criteria for hijab that I mentioned in the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith. Same thing is mentioned in the Hindu scriptures. It's mentioned in the Rigved, book number 8, hymn number 33, mantra number 19, that Brahma has made you a dame, has made you a lady. Therefore, do not look up, do not stare at a man, put your feet together and wear a veil. Further, it's mentioned in the Rigved, book number 10, hymn number 85, mantra number 30, that it is devilish and not white for a man to cover his thighs with the garment of his wife. So according to Hinduism, it's prohibited for one to wear the clothes of the opposite sex. And if you look at the historical records, even women, they wore a veil. There's a misconception regarding why Islam permits a Muslim man to have more than one wife. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 3, فَنْكِحُوا مَا طَابَ لَكُمْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ مَثْنَوْ وَثُلَاثَ وَرُبَى Marry women of your choice in twos, threes or fours. فَإِنْ قِفْتُمْ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا فَوَاحِدًا But if you fear that you cannot do justice, then marry only one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, Verse number 129. And you will never be able to do justice between your wives, but do not turn away from them altogether. Further, it's mentioned in the Hindu scriptures in Vishnu Sutra, chapter number 24, verse number 1. That Brahmin can have four wives. According to Mahabharat, Krishna, how many wives did he have? Four, ten, hundred. 16,108. If Krishna can have 16,108 wives, why can't a Muslim have maximum four? 
And for further details, you can refer to my DVD on women's rights in Islam, modernizing or outdated. In the conclusion of my talk, I would like to mention that the Britishers, they ruined us Indians. And at this time, there were many Hindu reformers. The pioneer amongst them was Raja Rab Mohan Roy, who was born in Bengal in 1772. And he learned English, Arabic, and Persian. And in 1803, he wrote a book which condemned idol worship. He said that God is one. He has got no images. God has got no avatars. He cannot become a human being. He was against casteism. And he formed a trust called the Brahma Samaj. And the offshoot of Brahma Samaj, even they believe that God is one. He has got no images. And he cannot become a human being. And the offshoot of Brahma Samaj was Prarthana Samaj, which was founded by Justice Vana Day. Justice Vana Day founded Prarthana Samaj in Mumbai. And it was strictly for the upliftment of women. He said that women, they should be educated. And he said that if a woman she gets widowed, she should remarry. Another great reformer was Swami Dayana Saraswati, who founded the Arya Samaj in 1875. He was a Vedantist. And he said that God is only one. He has got no images and he has got no altars. Another great reformer was Swami Vivekananda, who founded the Ramakrishna Mission. He said that though 99% of the Vedas are lost, 1% is remaining, yet it cannot be accommodated in a large hall. He said the word Hinduism, it is a misnomer. But the right word which should be used is a Sanatan Dharma or a Vedic Dharma or a Vedantist. So we need to realize that the Britishers, they had the policy of divide and rule, which led to the downfall of India. And as far as today's talk was concerned, whatever I've quoted, I've not quoted for my own self. It is what these great scholars have said, Raja Ram Mohan Roy, Justice Vana Day, and I have just quoted from the Hindu scriptures. And as far as today's talk is concerned, I have quoted from the Hindu scriptures leaving the way that I've quoted from the other scriptures because many of the Hindus, they are well versed with the other scriptures. For example, Bhagavad Gita, Manusmriti, etc. Therefore, I've quoted from the other scriptures. But if you remove all the other scriptures, leaving the Vedas, yet my talk is 100% the same. So the Britishers, the Englishmen, they had the policy of divide and rule which led to the downfall of India. And the politicians, they fell prey to this. Therefore, India is the country which has a maximum number of rights. The politicians, just for their vote bank, just for that seat, they can do anything. And some people say that politicians, they add fuel to the fire. I'd rather say that they add fire to the fuel. There was an article that came in the Times of India, said that in the next 20 years, according to Japan, India will be the superpower of the world. We will be the superpower. We'll be far superior to the Americans. Only and only if you follow our scriptures. The Hindus and the Muslims, we should get the commonalities together. Then we will, inshallah, inshallah, be the superpower of the world. It's by Shri Rigved, book number 10, hymn number 71, mantra number 4. Seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, near they understand. It is mentioned in Surah Baqarah. Chapter number two, verse number 44. Do you tell the people to do good while you forget yourselves? Don't you follow the scriptures? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, it's the Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 18. The deaf, the dumb, the blind, they will never return. Most of the religious leaders, they do not want to share the scriptures whether it be Islam, Christianity, or Hinduism, for their own benefit. And I've given a talk on Al-Quran, should it be read with understanding, which shows how important it is to read the glorious Quran with understanding. Though there are many sects in Islam, there are not major differences among the sects. All the sects believe that there's one God, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last and final messenger. So there are only minor differences among the sects. It is my humble appeal to the Indian government that to revive Sanskrit, Go back to your scriptures, go back to your Vedas and realize that God is one. And we Hindus and Muslims, we should get the commonalities from the Quran and the Vedas, then we will be united. 
and inshallah we Indians we will be the superpower of the world I would like to end my talk with a quotation from the glorious Quran from Surah Yunus chapter number 10 verse number 108 قُلْ يَا أَيُّوَ النَّاسِ قَدْ جَاءَكُمُ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ Say, O people, the truth has come from the Lord. فَمَنْ اِحْتَدَى فَإِنَّمَا يَحْتَدِي لِلْنَفْسِ Then whosoever gains guidance from it, then he will benefit. وَمَنْ ضَلَّ فَإِنَّمَا يَضِلُّ عَلَيْهَا And whosoever goes astray, then he will lose. وَمَا أَنَا عَلَيْكُمْ بِوَكِيلٍ And I am not a disposer of affairs over you. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Jazakallah Brother Farid for your informative talk. We feel confident to speak our Hindu brothers and sisters and call them to common terms. I thank you all for being a very encouraging and a fantastic audience. Before we conclude the program, we as Dai of these trendsetters resolve with a very strong faith, immense determination and deep love for Islam. That with Allah's help, we'll break the barriers of sect We'll break the barriers of religion. We'll break the barriers of race. We'll break the barriers of color. The Muslim Ummah is today torn and bleeding. It's past estranged from each other. We, the trendsetters, will change the scenario. We'll transform this state. We'll bring about a glaring transformation, inshallah. I'm sure it is not just our dream. There are many others who would like to share with us. I thank Dr. Zakir Naik on behalf of Islamic International School for pioneering such a wonderful platform for the young budding dyes to exhibit their talent, learns, and press. I also thank the diligent Islamic Research Foundation research team and the enthusiastic Islamic International School staff for their efforts. Now I invite Brother Abdul Hafiz Mullah to present a dua in Arabic. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم إنا نحمدك ونستعينك ونستهديك ونستغفرك ونتوب إليك اللهم لك الحمد كله ولك الملك كله وإليك يرجع الأمر كله على نيته وسره نشكرك ولا نكفرك ونخلع ونترك من يفجرك لك الحمد بالإيمان ولك الحمد بالإسلام ولك الحمد بالأهل والمال والمعافاة كبت عدونا وأظهرت أمننا ووصدت رزقنا ومن كل ما سألناك ربنا أعطيتنا اللهم لك الحمد على ما أنعمت به علينا من نعمك العظيمة وآلائك الجسيمة حيث أنزلت علينا خير كتبك وأرسلت إلينا أفضل رسلك وشرعت لنا أفضل شرائع دينك وجعلتنا من خير أمة أخرجت للناس وهديتنا لمعالم دينك الذي ارتضيته لنفسك الذي بنيته على خمس شهادة أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمد رسول الله ويقام الصلاة وإيتاء الزكاة وصيام رمضان وحج البيت الحرام اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما إلهنا إلهنا إليك توجهنا ولمعروفك تعرضنا ولبابك قرعنا ومن فضلك سألنا فاقبل خشوعنا وارحم خضوعنا واجبر كسرنا واستر عوراتنا وآمن روعاتنا ويمن كتابنا ويسر حسابنا وتقل بالعمل الصالح ميزاننا إلهنا قد حضرنا خطم كتابك وأنقنا مطايانا ببابك فلا تبعدنا عن جنانك فإن أبعدتنا فلا حول ولا قوة إلا بك لا رب لنا سواك فندعو ولا مالك لنا غيرك فنرجو إلهنا من نقصد وأنت الرب المعبود
وإلى من نتجه وأنت صاحب القرم والجود يا من عليك يتوكل المتوكلون وإليه يلجأ الخائفون وبكرمه وجميل عوائده يتعلق الراجون ولواسع عطائه وجزيل فضله تبسط الأيادي ويسأل السائلون نسألك أن تجعل خير أعمالنا أواخرها وخير أعمالنا خواتمها وخير أيامنا يوم نلقاك فيه واجعل القبور بعد فراق الدنيا خير منازلنا وافسح بهذه قلحودنا ونجنا من كرب يوم القيامة وأهوال الطامة وبيض وجوهنا إذا اسودت وجوه العصاة يوم الحصرة والندامة اللهم اغفر لنا ولآبائنا وأمهاتنا ودبي أرحامنا ومن أوصانا بالدعاء ومن أوصيناه بالدعاء من أحبنا فيك ومن أحببنا فيك من كان منهم ميتا ومن كان منهم حيا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم إنك أمرتنا بالدعاء ووعدتنا بالإجابة فلا تردنا خائبين اللهم اجعلنا من عتقائك من النار ومن المقبولين اللهم إن رحمتك أوسع من ذنوبنا وعفوك أوسع من خطايانا اللهم هب المسيئين منا للمحسنين اللهم أعط الغني عنا ونحن الفقراء إليك ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاسرين ربنا اغفر لنا ولإخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف رحيم ربنا اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وإسرافنا في أمرنا وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين ربنا لا تواقدنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إصرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به واعف عنا واعف عنا واغفر لنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم واغفر لنا إنك أنت الغفور الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد ما ذكره الذاكرون الأبرار وصل على محمد ما اختلف الليل والنهار وصل على محمد وعلى المهاجرين والأنصار سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين May Allah accept all our efforts and shower his choices blessing upon us and help us to organize many more events like this and reach Millions of Priest TV. The next program of this series will be in June 2010. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika. Ashadu wa la ilaha anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Oh people of the world, can we spare a little justice?